Hey, folks, here on, uh, what's the date? June 9th at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, talking about this upcoming full moon in Scorpio in Jeshta Nakshatra. As it says here, more intensity and danger. Um, don't like all the drama, but it's what's happening. Um, that's going to be on June 14th. In this time between now and then, you know, we're, we're in a very precarious situation, um, culturally, socially, personally, of course, there's a lot of potential for all this spiritual development and growth with all that Scorpio energy. Um, Scorpio is that sign where we transform our emotional fears into strengths and devotion. Again, that's a very simple way to say it. Nice, concise, succinct sentence. But what that involves is our emotional fears. <laughs> that's not a small thing. Uh, transformation. People just can't wait to transform, right? We all love to transform, actually. No, we don't. Nobody wants to transform. Everyone has a ton of emotional fears, and people don't have a lot of strength, and they have no devotion. So that's why it's hard. <laughs> that's why this is a difficult sign. So don't let a simple sentence like that fool you, okay? Because I'm good at putting together a sentence that summarizes something doesn't mean it's simple. In fact, it's one of the hardest things anyone does is transform anything to ever encounter and look at their emotional fears and triggers. In fact, we disown it constantly. Oh, no, I'm not afraid. It's just this, that, this, that. It's not because I'm afraid. Um, you know, and again, strength, which is the strength to actually do that and look at ourselves, right? <laughs> Who does that? Like no one. And be truly devoted, devotional. Who has any devotion these days like none of us we're devoted the thing that we're devoted to though and the scorpio issue is we wind up being devoted to our disassociation of the things that are really triggered by emotional fears so instead of actually transforming we're still devoted but we're devoted to that paranoid story or that that fear triggering mechanism. We become devoted to that. And we become devoted to our justifications to change nothing. <laughs> and so ultimately, you know, this is how Scorpio often shows up. Scorpio energy, right? And again, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying Scorpios. So if you're a Scorpio person listening, I'm not talking about you. Hang on one second, just to make sure. I'm not talking about you personally. It's not personal and all that because of all the signs that tend to get upset sometimes when I speak, it's I'll have Scorpios, Scorpios, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the sign, getting like upset. So don't get upset, all right? Under Because underneath all of that is enormous integrity, loyalty, authentic devotion, and being very connected to the heart in a sort of unshakable way. Because ultimately Scorpio is also that sign of like, unshakable faith, unshakable devotion, because it's a fixed sign. So again, this is why Scorpio energy is either very devoted and fixed and loyal to one story or another. Like, what is the, what are you devoted to? What is, I say you, but I mean us in general. This is a universal concept. We're all attached and emotional and devoted to some story and much of that story revolves around our triggering and our fears and all that other stuff. Not, We're not devoted to transforming them. <laughs> we're devoted to hanging on to them and justifying them and trying to prove that it's true. So that's the thing to sort of take forward, okay, <clears throat> with a Scorpio energy. Once we actually become devoted to transforming our emotional triggers and buttons and paranoias and projections and all that stuff, once we become authentically devoted to transforming that and being authentically strong, then we get that unshakable faith and loyalty to truth and to authentic devotion and bhakti and purity in the heart. And then that becomes the thing that we're devoted to. So this is the, this is the sort of switch. It's why it's a complicated energy here. Um, it has the <clears throat> sort of confrontational quality of Mars and the sort of defense, but it's 
emotional and it's stuck and it's watery. And so again, there's quite a bit of complexity there. And it's easy. One of the things about Scorpio, people who are Scorpio, is once they get it and they find that thing to be devoted to and they get it, oh, yeah, that's right. Then they all have the courage and we can have the courage once we see what's happening to take it on and to authentically change and transform. So this is why, by the way, a lot of Scorpio are interested in astrology and the occult and all this kind of stuff and that sort of alchemy because that's what they're really trying to do. They just need to understand, no, this is what's happening underneath it all, is this sort of triggering. So this is what we're in right now. And as you see, even at the top of this, it says full moon in Scorpio number two. Because the last full moon that we had on May 14th was just, oh, I'm sorry, May 16th, just two days earlier. First of all, that one was a lunar eclipse. And it was also this debilitated moon. But that's when that Buffalo shooting happened where the guy burst into the store in Buffalo and killed all those people. That was the last full moon in Scorpio, which was also a an eclipse. So this is the second full moon in Scorpio. And in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to play you the video that I made on my June forecast talking about this full moon eclipse. And I made some predictions at the time that have turned out to be pretty prescient so far as we're leading up to this full moon. But first, I also, you know, before I jump in, I do want to encourage people to like, share, and subscribe. And of course, ring the bell on YouTube to get notified. And also, um, you know, on the other platforms, please share this. Again, I'm not being paid to do this. I'm doing it because I want to share and I think it can be helpful. And I like talking about these things. But if you do really appreciate it, that's the way you show it. And I also want to let people know I'm, I'm really doing a lot of work with remedies, spiritual practices these days because we're in these intense times. Saturn just turned retrograde, these intense eclipses. That we're still in this eclipse cycle, which I'm going to talk about once I start really getting into this. Um, but we need to understand and transform the ignorance that we are under. We're all egoistic, triggered, all the stuff I just mentioned about nobody wants to transform. Nobody wants to look at themselves because we're an ego. You're an ego. <laughs> you think this separate person is the real thing. And we fight to defend this all the time. We don't have spiritual perspective. We don't understand. We don't do spiritual practices. We don't even really know what they are, how they work, why they work. And astrology is a great tool for understanding that. So I'm breaking those things down. There's a weekend course, June 11th and 12th. Also, lifetime access to all the recordings if you're seeing this later. But I also have a special um, Q&A with Mas Vidal on June 19th, who is a well-known Ayurveda and yoga teacher of uh, Dancing Shiva. He's also going to join. But as you see, I have tons of checklists and graphics and templates for this weekend course where we're going to be talking about the elements, the way to heal the elements, the way to heal our karma. So it, it's not just a, a bunch of ideas. All this stuff I was just talking about with Scorpio, the healing potential of this sign. If you're a Scorpio person, you have planets there or whatever, it's impossible for you to heal unless you understand things like Mars, the water, fixed energy, tamasic energy. Whether you know it or not, healing the pathology of that sign or any sign, because all the signs have a pathology, all healing happens based on these principles, whether you know that's what's happening or not. Again, most of the time we go through and we don't even know why things are happening. And then people start studying astrology and they start getting a little bit of a hint, but it's all intellectual. Oh, okay. I figured this thing. Oh yeah. This information is great. I really learned something, but nothing really changes because you're not even energetically working with the remedies or the healing. It's just something up there in your head that gives your ego a, a, an explanation that it likes a little bit better. And it's better. It's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't really change much. I see people that are not changing hardly anything. There's still the same stuff keeps happening. So again, we're going to break this down. This isn't, and again, we're talking about chakras here. Chakras are not just some word we get to invent. They're Sanskrit. They're connected to an entire 
path of yoga, Sankhya philosophy. I know in the West, chakras are now everything. By the way, it's not chakra. If you are teaching, stop saying chakra. Please, 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 for your own benefit. It's chakra. Ch chakra. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, anyway. But again, it's not ruled by Neptune and all this other stuff. This is literally from an energetic matrix. And we know how it works, why it works. They're literally connected to elements and all this other stuff. They're related to, again, elements, then karma injurious, jnana injurious. All of the Vedic remedies are aligned with specific practices. People say, what gem should I wear? You don't even know what the gem is doing or why it's doing it. What mantra should I say? You don't even know what mantras are or what they're for. I'm not, and by the way, you could not know it and still benefit from it. But how much more do you benefit from it if you actually learn what it is and you learn what you are and who you are and how your karma has descended through the elements, operated through the gunas? And again, whether you know this is happening or not, it is. So why not learn it? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So I'm going to be teaching that. And again, it's also a path, a very methodical path of how to analyze these things and see the spiritual practices that lead to your dharmic power, your spiritual destination, your svadharma, your embodied truth and wisdom. And again, whether you know that's what you're trying to do or not, it is. It's what you're trying to do. You're not that complicated. You're not that unique. You're really not. You're on the same path we're all on, really. Trust me. But you have a different path to it. The path is unique. We're all little snowflakes, yes. But snowflakes are just frozen water. Sorry. You don't have a special composition of snowflake. No, you're frozen water. And yes, it looks different. It's a different design. So we spend so much time analyzing the design that we forgot that we know what created the design. So again, astrology allows us to analyze each little snowflake. And that's what you are, my precious. You're a little snowflake. You are. But underneath it all, you're frozen water. And one day, whoosh, guess what? So the chart allows us to analyze the specifics of the snowflake so that we can get back to the svadharma, the embodied truth and wisdom. This is why the practices are universal and transcendent, and they align all the energy. They align all the energy, whether we know that's what's happening or not. So anyway, the class itself, there's a lot of bonus classes that you get. It winds up being more than 15 hours of courses, only $47, ridiculously low price, because I want people to learn this stuff. As you see, VedicAstrologyRemediesCourse.com is where you can get the course. And I'll pop the link in here. I forgot to do it. So anyway, this um, is what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to put this link in here. So this is the chart that of this full moon. And as you can see, this is going to be happening on the 14th. Sun and moon. This is the second full moon in Scorpio. The first one, again, happened on May 16th. And two days earlier, we had that shooting, that mass shooting in Buffalo, right before that eclipse, that solar eclipse. Two weeks earlier, though, on May 2nd, on the solar eclipse, we had the leak about the Supreme Court and the Roe v. Wade decision that really sent an uproar and a shockwave um, through. Um, and sh shortly thereafter, we started seeing protests at the justices' houses and things like that. We're in, so again, since early May, since this last eclipse, solar eclipse, we've had some very earth-shattering events. I haven't even mentioned that on May 24th, we had the Ivaldi shooting. So these shootings, these this this Roe v. Wade decision. By the way, I'm going to be talking about you know quite a bit of this stuff today. In addition to how to handle the energy, um, but uh, in a recent update in my in my June forecast that I did on May 30th, I talked about this full moon. In Scorpio. I talked about it for about 10 minutes. It was pretty intense. I talked a lot about the danger, other kind of stuff. 
and I, I'm, I want to play the last bit of it because I started talking about the, the fear and the very real danger of things like assassinations. And I said some very specific things. And I want to play that for you now so you can hear what I said and we'll just listen to it. Um, June 14th. Again, then we also have, as, as you see right here, sun is about to shift. As you see, it's at this last degree. So again, this full moon as well. These two planets are in their Sandy points. Very unpredictable energy here. Very last degrees. They're changing signs. This moon especially is in the Gandanta point. Expect this. Again, this is a very, another, I'm going to say it, very potentially dangerous day, dangerous time. We might see right around this time another crazy thing like this, another weird shooting or something. By the way, Jeshta and Mula also have to do with things like assassinations. And maybe this is the stuff that's going to happen. There, somebody's going to go kill like a senator or something or a congressperson or something like that. We saw after Roe v. Wade. By the way, this last thing. People protest protest, peaceful protest and vigils outside the houses of the Supreme Court justices. By the way, I'm not saying I think that stuff should happen. But what happened immediately after? You want to see how fast the Congress moves? Immediately after, they all passed a law that said, you're not allowed to go near Supreme Court justices. Now that's like a law. You see how fast they can move on laws and do things when they're worried about themselves? They're the elites. Oh my God, don't protest outside the house of a Supreme Court justice. They can pass laws like that when they care about it. These people know that the reason we're suffering all these murders is because of guns. They all know it. But we saw also after Roe v. Wade, again, they start having these vigils. This is a foreshadowing. What option are you leaving people? You're leaving people no options. Take away their rights, even though hardly even though vast majority of people do not want it overturned. Vast majority of people, 90% want sensible gun laws. No, 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 we're going to do nothing. What option do you leave people? Peacefully protest outside their house. No, 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 you can't do that. You're going to start seeing people blow. And I mean, you, you might start seeing some assassinations of these public officials. And I don't want that. I'm not saying it's justified. Of course it's not. I'm saying these type of things can be a catalyst. Imagine if someone assassinates, I'm not going to say any names, but something like it's a symbol of the right or the left or whatever, and what that would do. These are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Assassination or some other kind of, again, any kind of thing could happen in America. We're awash with guns and crazy people like the rest of the world, and we're descended upon constantly with propaganda inspiring this kind of stuff. Where does he think this stuff's going to lead? This is a very dangerous time. I said before this year is going to be, I don't know how it's going to play out, but we can see this lunation right here is not is no joke either. It's not an eclipse, but you've got a debilitated Gandanta moon. Again, Venus Rahu are very close as well. Sun is right at the edge, and Mars is about to go into Aries again. So there, there could be a very unpredictable, catalyzing event, something that happens around this, around the middle of June, that could lead to some uh, a lot of stuff. And then by the time you get Mars, Rahu, and Aries, it's ten times worse. So yes, I'm putting that out there because this is no joke. And again, people watch your mental health beyond this type of social triggering and stuff like that. Again, and I say this not as a bypassing, but as a reality. These, there's also enormous spiritual power in these times. And it's and it's and it's definitely true.
Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Thank you. Um, I played that because it was not only foreshadowing what we're ta- what we're seeing now, or what we're what we're going to be seeing even more of, but some very specific things have happened recently where we see this more and more coming true, particularly a couple days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, someone was arrested outside of the house of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, ready to assassinate him. I mean, he wasn't playing around. He had full regalia and guns and knives and all kinds. I mean, he was... This danger is real. Whether I again, I don't want any of this kind of stuff to happen. Of course not. The energy is there. I taught I literally said this is the energy that's going on. The energy of like assassinations and other things like that um, is palpable now. Uh, there's no question that we're in very dangerous times relative to what could happen. And that, what I said last week, or on the 20, I, I did that on May 30th, so we, I guess it was last week. What's this, the June 9th? As the moon gets closer to this full moon, we're seeing it. By the way, we have these hearings, these January 6th hearings are going to be starting. Again, nothing with the moon going through Libra, join K2. Again, very public, you know, very polarizing activities are going to happen. That's going to polarize things even more. They're going to go into next week as we build up to this full moon. This is um, major, major intensity happening now and this like i say i'm also looking forward i wish i should say looking ahead to in a month from now with mars in aries with rahu and then getting closer throughout july and into early august and again a sort of catalyzing event right now, especially these ne- this next week or so, is one of the most, it, it's very h- high possibility of very dangerous things happening. We already see the environment is rich for these kinds of, even if it's just another like mass shooting. I mean, we talk about it now, we're just blasé about it. Since the, since the Uvalde, there's been like 30 mass shootings and we don't bat an eye. You know, we don't even care. Oh, oh, it was only five people. Does that even count as a mass shooting anymore? Oh, another abhorrent thing was said about gun policies. It was this John Thune talking about shooting varmints. You know, some of this, this is just people are, are, these are, this is not a democracy anymore. I don't want to get too political, but I'm going to say this and then I'm going to move on. But, Every poll that's taken, every geographic strata, the country wants gun wants real gun prohibitions and background checks and sensible stuff. And these politicians just won't do it. And again, this is just one example, but there are more. Again, now we're about to throw more gasoline on the fire with these January 6th trials in the Senate or um, hearings in the Senate. So we are in very combustible, volatile times to say the least, no matter where you come down on it politically, if you want to just turn us about my politics or whatever, whatever. doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with that part of it. What can't be disputed is these are the times we're in combustible, volatile, things ready to blow. And this point between Jeshta and Mula, which is where this full moon is happening, is the most dangerous Gandanta point. It's the most dangerous Gandanta point. 
Gandanta means this junction between the fire and water signs where the nakshatra and the rashi both end. And of course, this is in Indian astrology only because in Indian astrology, everything is pinned to the nakshatras. The nakshatras define the zodiac space and then the rashis lay on top of it, the zodiac signs. So Ashwini and Aries are at the beginning of the zodiac, as it says in all the texts, and as it was done forever up until the ninth century. And then when you do this, then by the time you get to zero Sagittarius, you wind up where Jeshta ends and Mula begins. With all the other zodiac signs, when one moves into the next, there's a nakshatra that bridges that transition point. Between the fire and the water signs, there is no, or I should say water and fire, water leading into fire, there is no nakshatra bridge. So Jeshta ends and Mula begins at the same point where Scorpio ends and Sagittarius begins. And this is right at the last degrees. This is not only close to the edge, this is in the Gandanta point. It's less than one degree. So even if it's just a couple degrees, it starts to get really dicey. This is like less than one degree. This is where the Gandanta point is most unstable. What this means is all of this unstable, Scorpio, paranoid, triggered, and I'm going to show you who's boss energy gets explosive and unpredictable. Again, we manage it most of the time, but when it gets at this point, this Jeshta Mula point, it becomes unstable. It becomes harder to hold all of that emotional volatility. Instead, there's an emotional attacking. Again, this is what Scorpio people and Scorpio energy in general has to be careful of just attacking others emotionally. It's literally like emotional water attack Mars. That could be, that's difficult when people have a lot of Scorpio energy is the emotional attacking gets hard <laughs> to like, instead of attack others, they need to attack their insecurities and vulnerabilities. But th this, this last degree of Jeshna becoming Mula is where that energy becomes very unstable. And it means that people who are unstable with access to high power weaponry do crazy stuff. And by the way, this is all around the world. We I'm talking about American politics, but we have this, the we have war in Ukraine, we have unstable situations all over the world. Someone just made a comment about China. We have again, they've been making threats against Taiwan. North Korea has been um again, uh, re-engaging with their, with their nuclear program. God knows what could happen. Again, I'm just looking at, I could talk about U.S. politics and all this stuff. Someone said, yeah, man, of course, all, all over the world, we have stuff that could just boil over Canada. All the problems that, you know, the frustration with a lot of the people with the Trudeau, you know, government. So it's just a, this is a, cauldron of potential. By the way, I haven't even mentioned the potential for natural disasters. This is where earthquakes and volcanoes and other things like also can be very volatile on lunation cycles in general. But this one, these, this is a little different. This, it doesn't have the classical signatures where you usually see Saturn and Jupiter also very close to one of the one of the luminaries or in the lunation cycle. So I'm not so sure of that, but but especially the social and psychological sort of boilerplate. And again, even in the video I said from last month, I literally said this is the th the big thing I I focus on is the potential for the assassinations. Again, there was a confrontation with Senator Ted Cruz. There's been a lot of publicized ones where people are coming, going up to them. It was in Texas after they went down and had that big photo op 
after the kids were killed. All the people who vote to never do anything about gun laws are up there, you know, here we are concerned on a stage and people are confronting these politicians. Again, those people could be carrying guns too. You, anything could happen. But what happens if something is going to blow here? We're not going to just keep avoiding this. Could, these things could just lead to something else. So I've said from the beginning with, with 2021, I said it last year that this Rahu Mars in, in, at the end of the summer or in the middle of the summer was incredibly volatile. So we're leading up to that right now with this, eclipse, with this full moon, this second full moon in Scorpio. It's debilitated moon. It's Gandanta at the very last degrees. And again, leading up to that, the thing to understand, this is June 14th. But the moon goes into Scorpio on June 12th, 12th, 13th. It's debilitated and getting ready to be exactly full for a couple days beforehand. Okay, The buffalo shooting happened a couple days before the actual full moon. Again, that was an eclipse. But the moon is going to hit that same like previous eclipse point and be debilitated in Scorpio for a couple days before it gets to this exact full moon. So again, the 12th and 13th of June, just incredibly dangerous times and even shortly after. So I want people to see this. Now, to get to things less, less mundane and potentially scary in that context. But again, one of the things also is you can see astrology working. And you can see how if you put a little forethought into it, like I did last month and spoke correctly about this, or uh, about 10 days ago, you can see these things coming. And I don't talk about things like this very often, but this is a singularity. This is very, very dangerous. I, frankly, some astrologers, every time they talk, they're talking about the end of the world. <laughs> I don't talk about this kind of stuff like this that often. So it is very serious. That's why I mentioned it. That's why I played this again. But again, within all of this, there's enormous, and I'm seeing it too, enormous devotion and, pow <clears throat> and power around our teachings and our devotion to our teachings and our, and taking those things serious, uh, you know, taking those things seriously. Because whenever we're in these eclipse cycles, which we're still in some ways kind of still in that eclipse cycle a bit because the moon is still passing through the sign he was in when he was eclipsed. There's enormous reckoning and, and um, you know, potential for this deep emotional and personal and spiritual transformation, but it's all, it has to go through your, psychological triggering and wounding and projection, especially the dark negative projections onto the world. One of the things that that all lunations lead to is that sort of um, harmonization that needs to take place between that self which is transcendent, that universal self of the sun, and that emotional body of the moon. And again, here in Scorpio, and as we move up to it, there's a lot of potential to, to become still, become peaceful and established in the heart, much more so than at other times, um, because the emotions are going to be much more volatile. Um, and the other thing that's happening is because this full moon, of course, is part of a cycle based on where the sun is, right? So we also currently have the sun and Mercury in Taurus. So we're feeling this stable Taurus energy as being a kind of divine light is coming because the sun is in Taurus, which is saying, I want to be peaceful and calm and happy and stable. And I want a happy, peaceful, beautiful world, stable world. And then we look out and we see the craziness and it's hard. But the real promise of Taurus, which is opposite all of this Scorpio volatility, is that peace and contentment and stillness 
and that sort of arrival of the moment and arrival of us into the moment where we arrive in the moment full with full presence and fully present in each moment, which is, again, beautiful, stable, harmonious through our senses rather than our senses wanting to grab and possess and consume. We simply delight in the presence of the of the moment. We find the bliss of the moment because that's the only bliss there is, is in the moment. When you're blissful, you're in the moment. And when you're in the moment, there's bliss. When you're in time, when you're in past and future, you're not in the moment and you're not in bliss. You're trying to take something rather than experience your true nature, which then wants to just give something, which just wants to give. Because you know there's nothing here that's yours that you can possess, that you can take. And that is what drains our energy, is this constant sort of hankering and longing for happiness rather than joy and bliss. Happiness is some experience, some sensual moment, one way or another. That'll make me happy, that thing, that person, that experience. And it drains our energy as we seek it. But bliss is of the soul, and it's not based on an outer experience. It's an inner experience. It's not even an inner experience. It's an inner state. You don't experience... you. It feels like bliss because we're emotional and we have put everything into an emotional label, but it's actually not even bliss as an emotion. It's a state. Like my guru Ama says, love isn't an emotion. It's a flow. It's And it's a flow of your true self. It's not, there's nowhere to go with it. It's just the natural state. And the natural state is that. The natural state is, I don't even like to use the word love because that sounds like some emotional high. It's not. It's peace and bhakti, devotion is really the word. And joy and bliss. Again, not, I'm happy. It's not a charge. Because the opposite of I'm happy is I'm sad or I'm angry. These are the roller coaster of emotion. Devotion, even though it's flat, it doesn't mean it's flat like a dead flat. It's not flat like this. It's flat like this. It's vertical. This is the emotions, roller coaster, vertical emotion. And devotion is vertical. It's not flat like you're dead. It's vertical like you're... So Taurus is that portal into devotion and especially through santosha or contentment. Santoshi, Santoshi Ma, one of the great names for the Divine Mother. And a very famous bhajan that we sing to Amma. Jai Santoshi Ma, Jinki Haruna He Appa, Jinki Enko where one of the big lines is Jai Santoshi Ma, Santoshi, Santosha. Content, the peaceful mother that's content with everything. And I'll tell you the story about Alma, one thing, and I, I observe this very closely in satsangs. There was a, one of her swamis, his name is Swami Ramakrishna. Those who know Alma know he's one of the funnier, when his, his satsangs are often are often humorous. He likes to inject humor. And Alma sits there while the Swami is given the satsang. And I noticed there was a time when he would give a satsang and he would make this little bit of a joke. He would say, so many times we all think, Alma, why don't you just rest? Just rest. 
And we imagine Alma just relaxing on a beach somewhere like the rest of us. Because, by the way, Alma never rests. She ne hardly ever sleeps. She's constantly, constantly doing stuff for us. Constantly. And all of us just long to see her rest. Like we think, oh, like we want to see her comfortable, right? Because she was always working so hard. And Ramakrishna says, we all imagine Amma just at rest, lying on a beach. And as soon as he says this, she's I've seen this a couple of times in satsang. She'll interject and she'll stop him and she'll say in Malayalam, Amma is always at rest. And then the Swami will stop and go, he'll translate and go, Amma made sure to, for me to tell you that she's always at rest. She's always content. Literally saying, you see me doing all this work and you see me taking on all this karma and you see me not sleeping and you see me doing through all this, what looks like I'm disturbed or what would be a lot of activity. I'm always at rest. I'm always at peace. Think about that. And by the way, again, those of you who haven't seen Amma before, don't know what I'm talking about or whatever, watch videos or something or realize that Amma will do a program. I've seen Amma give a program for 16 hours straight where she doesn't get up and go to the bathroom. I mean, just think about sitting in a, on a stool and not going to the bathroom for 16 hours. Just that. You're not doing anything, but just sitting there. Of course, she's not doing that. She's constantly, ugh, I mean, you, you can't imagine it. It's not a human being. But the power, and we see her do this all the time. And you see her, she looks like she's limping or she looks like this and that. And we're like, the thing that makes me most devoted and most emotional around Amma is that very thing that Swami Ramakrishna was saying. And she makes sure to say, I'm always at rest. I'm always at peace. Whatever it is you see my body doing, Amma is always at rest. Amma is always at peace. And you know it's true. Because if it wore on her even a little bit, she wouldn't be able to do it. It's impossible. If she had a body like we have, it is impossible that she could do it for even one day. It's impossible that any of us could do what Amma does for even one day. I'd love to see someone sit there and try to do in one day, one, once, what Amma does every day. <laughs> and again, you, you you really see this when you spend a lot of time around her, like go on a retreat or even, even spend two days around her. And you can't believe it. Like, she's back again? <laughs> What's going on here? She, was, she left the hall last night at 3 a.m. Now she's back at 10 a.m. She's going to hug people till 5 p.m. She'll come back at 8 p.m. and hug people till 4 a.m. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. No day off. We couldn't do what she does for one day. We couldn't even do one program. We'd collapse. It's because we're in our body. And we would be sitting there going through all of these likes and dislikes. Oh, I can't wait to hug her. Oh, she's hot. Oh, I don't care. Ugh, I got to hug this person. Oh, they smell. They stink. What are you saying? Uh, leave me alone. I <laughs> Think about it. And again, we who've seen Alma for a long time kind of don't. Pay attention. The point is, this is like an embodiment of this Taurus energy. An embodiment of that energy. And this entire, the, this and this concept of Santosha, this concept of Santosha where we know that we're not the body. We're in the moment and we're just totally dialed into the flow of bhakti, devotion, bliss, joy. And you see, she's blissful. Amma is both solid as a mountain and light as a feather. This is one of my, my friends who does Tai Chi, because that's one of the goals in Tai Chi, is to be solid as a mountain and light as a feather. And because he is the Tai Chi instructor, his recognition of divinity 
is through the realm of Tai Chi. And so he recognizes in Amma a Tai Chi master because that's his aspiration. I recognize in Amma as the culmination and the embodiment of all of the astrology. This is the culmination of it. This is, she's embodying all this planetary energy, fully developed. This is what I refer to. This is what I think about when I talk about astrology and think about it. Decade or more, more than a decade, almost two, actually more than two decades of sitting in front of Alma watching the culmination of all this astrology stuff. There it is, right in front of me. That's what a Satguru does. And so I'm saying this because this Santosha, this Taurus energy. And yes, there's a lot of talk here. It, her, her name is Amachi, Mata Amritananda Mai, which is a long word. You can go to ama.org. Let me let me pop the I'll, I'll pop the link in here. And I'm talking about it because she's always appropriate when referring to a spiritual ideal and all the principles that we can aspire to for all the planets, all the signs, all the houses. When you see a Sadhguru like this, Sadhguru means a teacher of the purest and highest wisdom. They're an embodiment of all this spiritual wisdom. And we, it, it can be very intellectual for us. By the way, I had done meditation, deep meditations for 20 years before I ever met Alma. And I, I knew what I was talking about. I could have talked very similar to everything that you hear me say 20 years ago relative to all the yogic stuff. But the devotion, the, the connection between all of that experience and the embodied lived experience, man, nothing, nothing brought it home like sitting in front of an embodiment of whatever it is that you think is the most beautiful thing you could imagine, there it is right in front of you. If you think that the embodiment of divinity is the divine dance or whatever it might be, there it is, the most beautiful dancer ever, embodying all the principles of the cosmic dance or yoga, the most incredible yogi master ever, tapas like you could never believe. You read the stories in the texts about these great yogis who did this incredible rigorous tapas where, where they suffered and burned in the fire pit so they could get these spiritual powers. Show me anyone, maybe who's ever existed, who has done as much tapas as Alma. <laughs> the greatest tapasya ever. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine. And we would have heard about it if someone did this at some point, if it was even possible to travel all around the world and hug millions and tens of millions of people, all the charities, anybody, anyone who hasn't heard of her, go and look and see what I'm talking about. <laughs> but so an embodiment of all of it, really, the discipline, the courage, the devotion, the humor, the intelligence, the wisdom, all of it. But as it relates to this Taurus energy, Santosha, contentment, beyond all this triggering and stuff I'm talking about, and beyond the world itself. And that doesn't mean you bypass the world. Again, to use Alma as an example, let's be very clear. Again, you cannot imagine what she does. The reason people say we wish we, she would just relax. Alma lives in India, where there's earthquakes and devastations and floods. And I mean, millions, tens of thousands of people buried in earthquakes and floods, all this. And you know what she does? Alma goes and parks herself right in the middle of all of that stuff and does these programs where she sits there and deals with these people who have lost everything. No money, no family, nothing. They've lost everyone. And she sits there and cries with them. Over and over again, you see pictures of her in these flood zones. She's not just sitting there tuned out. She's totally tuned in, totally dialed in, totally engaged. And not burdened by any of it. Because if she was burdened by it, like we would be, she wouldn't be able to do it. How, how could that be? I don't know. It's a mystery. 
I understand it somewhat conceptually, but I'm nowhere near it. Neither are the rest of us. And so often when people think that it's just some kind of worship that people have for a devil, for especially a guru like Amma, they have no idea. We've seen her do this. <laughs> do things that no human would do willingly to go sit there and go through agony with people like this. And then turn around and give them money and everything else to rebuild their villages. It's also not just symbolic. I say this because, again, in the midst of the worst chaos of the world, like after the tsunamis and after these earthquakes and all this stuff, Alma will go sit there and embody exactly the stuff I'm saying, being in this world of all these terrible laws and murders and all the terrible stuff we see, we're in it and be totally engaged and totally unaffected and free and liberated. And you'll see her go from one to the next often. She's totally in the moment. I remember another Swami one time talked about how he told a story to Amma one time. Uh, he was talking to her and she got very upset. Like she got very emotional and she was, you know, giving her full attention. She was totally there. And she even, you know, cried a little tear about this thing that he was going through. And he felt so heard and seen. And she was, you know, totally engaged and like, you know, gave him that Shakti. And then the next person came up and again, the next person came up and they were like smiling and happy. And Amma was like, totally like giddy like a child with this next with this next person and the swami recounted saying how he felt a little sad like come on amma can you still keep being sad for me <laughs> and he realized he's like no amma's totally in the moment she was he was totally in that moment with him like no one's ever been totally hearing the depth of what was happening and then the next person she's totally in the depth of what that person is it's one moment after the next it's not hanging on to the previous thing, dragging that along with us. We're just dragging our crap all over the place. We don't live anything pure. We're dragging our histories, projecting it onto everything, feeling mistreated, worried about everything. So again, I say this because this is a very deep healing potential right now. In the midst of all this darkness of the of the full moon and all this cultural stuff and worldly stuff, this key principle of devotion and santosha and the stable contentment of Taurus is really where the energy is coming from. That's what's trying to anchor all this volatility. So we also have Venus Rahu here in Aries. Um, they're going to be very close as well. This amps up that potential for not just cultural volatility, but even personal. Watch your personal connections and your compromises. And, and, and again, all that stuff is really going to be amplified. Excuse me. Between now and then, I'm recording this on June 9th. So this is on the 14th. There's quite a few days. That's why I decided to do this early. Because we're moving up through this debilitation point. This full moon happens at the end of Scorpio after it's been there for a couple days. But again, we also have this Mars, Jupiter, and Pisces. This is one of the reasons why there's such a power to want to rise above our ignorance right now. And by the way, the course that I talked about, you know, this course and whatnot, it's already well over 100 people. People really are interested in learning these spiritual practices and this stuff now. One of the reasons I planned it for now is because of this Mars-Jupiter. Jupiter in Pisces, Mars there, where we're, we really understand and we have the courage to actually learn this stuff. And instead of attack others, attack our own weaknesses and insecurities. And it, by the way, it doesn't even have to be, it's not vicious. Mars is also quite playful. It's just energy. It's like, you know, like I like to play tennis in a game and have a, have a, you know, have enthusiasm about it. It doesn't have to, it, it only turns vicious when we're defending something and defending our ego. 
Because we're an ego, Mars is difficult because we use his energy. We abuse it. We misuse it. We use it to attack others rather than to just to make ourselves strong. For example, like working out in a gym. That's Mars energy. Very well put, very well expressed. Playing sports, athletics. That's also Mars energy. It's very physical. But you can take something like physical exercise and turn it into something like Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga, where that heat and where you move the body very strategically, like a kind of martial artist, and you bring the energy inward and it becomes invigorating and very strengthening, not just physically, but then psychologically. And as you do those kinds of practices, you really develop psychological strength because you're realizing that you're the source of all your problems, not anybody else. So again, Mars, Jupiter, and Pisces, very powerful for that. And also Saturn just turned retrograde in Aquarius. A lot of introspection and a lot of reckoning with those things that we need to reckon with. We need to reckon with our solitude and stillness and things like that. So again, I, I encourage people to um, look at these this course, VedicAstrologyRemediesCourse.com. Check that out. I'll have a link below the video. And again, to really understand yourself and understand what spiritual practices are doing, how to really craft the right, the right approach to spiritual practices in your life. And again, how to approach even remedies and stuff. I get this all the time. What do I do about this? What remedy do you suggest for blah, blah, blah? It's more complicated. It's not that complicated, but it's more than I have this here. What do you think? I don't know what I think because I don't know the ascendant. I don't know anything. Like everything, we try to grab for some quick hit. We don't really want to learn it. We don't even really want to do it. So again, if you really want to do it, really want to learn it, I'm giving you the chance. Um, and astrology is a great tool for that. Of course, all those qualities, like I mentioned around Scorpio, you can do it with, you have to do it with every sign. Myself as Gemini, all this air, it could get very ungrounded. So there are things that I have a tendency toward. For example, like mantra. You hear me talking now, I have flood of thoughts all the time, but not just simple mantra, but I can say very complicated mantras, right? And I like it. I like these very complicated mantras. Not only do I have the skill to do it because it's my nature, but it takes me into a place that's that just opens up and orients all of that air. So instead of all that air just going all over the place, these very powerful mantras and that speech and that and, and organizing that around this power creates what's called prana or vitality, not just vata, which is the deranged form of air. The deranged form of air is vata. The powerful form of air is prana, right? Just like the deranged form of water is called, oja, um, is called um, uh, kapha, excuse me. The deranged form of water, all that kapha, stuck, emotional. The elevated is called ojas, which is devotional and energizing and healing. So again, all of this stuff is easy to, it's it's easy to learn. You should know it because your life depends on it, literally. <laughs> so we're going to break that down. So again, um, if you're seeing this after June 11th and 12th, all the recordings are available. But if you're seeing it before, go ahead and register. A lot of people are already there. We also have a great guest, Mas Vidal, who even has an Ayurvedic herb company where he's going to have some discounts for people. These herbal remedies and whatnot are fantastic. He's a world famous Ayurveda and yoga teacher, has had a school of Ayurveda and Jyotish forever. So he's going to be there as well. So I hope everyone has a great full moon in Scorpio. Santosha, bliss, peace is your true nature. Take care.